Thank you all. Thank you for the um, invitation to, to speak and present this work uh, to you today. So uh, it's a joint work uh, with uh, Matt Toynton, who, who is here somewhere. Um, ah, now it stopped working. Ah, OK. Um, so, so, um, yeah, so basic question in, 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 in the theory, in, in the study of growth of groups, uh, I mean, is to study, I mean, what is growth of groups about? It's, it's about understanding the size of the, the ball of radius n in a k-d graph, right? So, I mean, there are two, two settings in which you, you can study this, uh, this problem. The most common maybe is the, set of the, the setting of infinite groups where you ask for an asymptotics for the size of the ball of radius n, so the size of the, the set of elements in the group that can be written as products of length at most n in a fixed generating set. And the other setting is that of finite groups, so, so for finite groups, of course, you cannot ask for asymptotics because it's finite, but then you ask for diameter bounds. You ask for what's the, um, the smallest n uh, such that you reach the entire group. So what's the time needed to, to, to reach the entire group? So, um, so the diameter of the k um, So let, let me uh, recall um, Gromov's theorem on poly polynomial growth theorem. So it says that if you have a group with polynomial growth, then it has an nilpotent subgroup of finite index. And so polynomial growth here means that you, you assume, um, sorry, you assume a, a uniform uh, upper bound of polynomial type on the size of the, the, the ball of radius n. And so a natural question is, uh, in Gromov's theorem, is uh, what, what happens if you try to weaken the assumption of polynomial growth in, in some ways? So, um, so f for example, there is, uh, so f for example, is there can you go beyond polynomial growth and still have the same result? So um, somehow it follows from Gromov's original proof that in fact there is some function for which it's true by just by logic somehow. But, um, but Shalom and Tao uh, a few years ago were ab able to pinpoint a, a precise function. So it's n to the epsilon, log log n to the epsilon. So if function is, if a group grows less than that, then it's nil it virtually nilpotent. And the proof is, ba is based on this new proof of, Klein, uh, of uh, Gromov's theorem given by Kleiner uh, a, few, a few years ago. Maybe t already 10 years ago. 2007. Seven, OK. Um, and so in relation to this is uh, Grigor Chuk's gap conjecture. So this states that, in fact, um, e to the little o of square root of n should be enough to guarantee virtual nil nilpotence. And there is, okay, maybe a weak version of this is, you know, e to the n to the beta, sorry for the extra parentheses here, should be enough for some, for some beta. Okay, so this is wide open I in general, but um, there are cases where it has been um, proved. So for example, so originally um, strong evidence for this conjecture uh, was, uh, produced by, by, by Grigor Chuk, who, who proved it in the case of residually p groups, and then it was then extended to residually nilpotent groups. Um, uh, there is the argument of Grigor Chuk and lubotsky mann um, and, and the proof of this is based on somehow Lazar's work on um, uh, the characterization of um, p-adic analytic proper groups. And, and the weak gap conjecture is known for readily solvable groups by work of John Wilson. So recently there has been um, several improvements on Gromov's theorem itself. So I mentioned Kleiner's new proof. Uh, so we, Kleiner's proof was based on the study of harmonic functions of modular growth and inspired by the work of um, Kolding and Minikozzi on, on um, harmonic functions on, on, on manifolds. Uh, but in, in another direction, they, there was work by Hushovsky and myself and Green and Tao, where we gave um, re a refinement of Gromov's theorem in another direction, uh, based on a, a certain structure theorem for approximate groups. 
So uh, my talk will be focused on this, uh, uh, on this aspect and, and on some uh, consequences of that theorem. Okay, <coughs> so, um, right, so I, sorry, I keep going the wrong way. Okay, so uh, this, this theorem, which I just mentioned, this improvement of Go on Gromov's theorem, says that, in fact, you don't need the condition of polynomial growth to hold for every n, or every large enough n. It is enough that it holds for some large n. Okay, so if you know that there exists an n larger than some constant, depending only on the exponent of growth, which is considered to be fixed here, this d. If you assume this for some large n, then already you, you can conclude that the group is, is virtually nilpotent. Okay? And this, this n0 here, the, this, uh, f the, the first uh, scale at which you, if you have this condition, you can conclude that you, you are nilpotent, then this first scale is depends only on d. But it, it's, it's non-effective, so the proof does not give any bound on this. What's the quantifier for every g before? Uh, it, uh, yeah, it's for, for all groups, so it's, it's before, yeah. So if you have n0 depends only on d, not on g. Okay, so it's also, uh, there is n0 set up for every g. Yeah, okay. right, it's after. That's right. So I should remark here that uh, Gromov, uh, if you read uh, carefully his paper at the end, he, he says that in fact his proof gives more than that it's that's the f you know more than what is usually stated. It says that in fact uh, if you are given d and c, um, and if you assume that you have some group that satisfies this condition up to n zero of d of c. So if the polynomial growth holds for every n up to n zero then you can conclude that the group is nilpotent, virtually nilpotent, and the index and the rank uh, of the nilpotency class are all bounded in terms of D and C. Okay? So this, uh, this is already in Gormov's original 1981, 1981 paper. Okay? So the, 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 the gain here in this theorem is just that we can remove this condition for all up to, up to a certain scale but we can replace it by, it's enough that you have it at one scale, okay? And wh what's already remarkable about Gromov's theorem is that, in fact, this, you know, it's usually thought as a theorem about infinite groups, but this, this in fact, holds for finite groups as well, right? This result, this. And it mi it's meaningful for finite groups. So is this result of, uh, with, with Green and Tau. Um, so, so the proofs uh, are, are based on, on this structure theorem for approximate groups that I mentioned. So I'm not going to define approximate groups, I think. Sorry, Terry. Um, but, uh, sorry. But I'm uh, only going to, to define um, sets of, of uh, small doublings, so I'll say a word about this. So. Um, so the structure theorem says something about the, the shape or, you know, the structure of an of a arbitrary, of a subset of an arbitrary group which satisfies this condition. So this set A is maybe a large finite set, and you look at the product of A with itself, and you, 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 you ask that the, the size of the product is at most k times the size of, of, of the set, where k is some fixed some fixed number, so maybe 10, maybe 10,000. And you say that such a set has doubling at most k. And the conclusion of the theorem is that whenever you have such a set in a group, then there is a very good reason why this happens, and, and this, hap this, this is because the set A is quite close to a virtually nilpotent subgroup. So there is some nilpotent group you know, that which is responsible for the, the lack of growth of this under multiplication of that set. And so this, sorry, 
this this nilpotent uh, so so the conclusion is that a can can be, is contained in that most c of k translates of some finite but nilpotent subgroup of g left translates or right translates and 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 the the, the finite part of this finite nil by nilpotent subgroup is con is controlled by a so it's contained in 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 some some fixed power of so yeah so you can express every element of h as a, a small word in the elements of a or inverse. Okay. And so now you, you can think how, why is this relevant for Gromov theorem? I mean, the, the reason is suppose you have, you have some condition of growth on the ball of radius n in your group, then look at, so, you know, look at all scales before this n. And by the pigeonhole principle, at some scale, you must have this doubling condition. Because otherwise, if you don't have this doubling condition at some scale, it means that at every scale, you grow under doubling. And this will means that you grow at some speed, and this speed will, will be bigger than this polynomial bound that you, fixed, you prescribed um, at some stage. So, so in other words, if, if you have some polynomial bound at some, at some scale, then there will be a set of small doubling um, at some maybe smaller scale. So the, the ball of radius n at some maybe smaller n will be doubling. And so you can apply this structure theorem and you can tell, you can, you can therefore say something about the structure of the group uh, that you are looking, looking at. So, um, so what about finite groups? Great. So let gamma be the diameter of a calligraph. So the, um, uh, there is a old lemma of, or the theorem of Feynman, which is valid for every group, which is quite useful, which says that whenever you have a set like this, where the, the doubling is less than three halves, then the, there is a very good reason for this to happen. The reason is because you are, in fact, in a co-set of a subgroup. Now, if A is a finite subgroup, then it, doesn't, it is stable under multiplication, so it does not grow. But if it does not grow, really does not grow in, to the, in the sense that this is this, the set of products is less than 3 halves se se the size of A, then A must be contained, must be a large part of a coset of a, of a finite subgroup. And this finite subgroup is not much bigger than the size of A. And in fact, you can even conclude that G here, um, that H, G is in the normalizer of H, so actually it's uh, in even on leaf condition. Question? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, three halves here. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you could, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so in particular, if you, whenever you have a group and you have a subset S that makes a positive proportion of the group, then the diameter is bounded because it is going to grow, and at some point it will be more than, you know, it will be more than three halves, and and, and you, you you get the whole group. Okay. So, so the question I want to address in this talk is, is this. So what, what happens, what can be said about a finite group if you know that the k-degraph has large diameter? Okay, so there is a famous conjecture in this context, which is um, Babai's conjecture, and which asserts that they ought to be universal constants C and D, such that if you have a um, non abelian finite simple group, um, the diameter is bounded by, uh, it's a polylog bound on the diameter. So the <coughs> diameter is bounded by a constant times log G to some power. So it's known in certain cases. So actually, I think probably the first finite simple groups for which it was proved is PSL2 FP, it was proved by Harald. And then there were generalizations by Pieber and Sabo and myself and Green and Tao, where we extended these to all finite simple groups of bounded rank. 
So bounded rank means we, we fix rank. So for example, PSLN FQ, we fixed N. And this the constant D here, this exponent, uh, depends on N. Okay, but the point is that it does not depend on the size of the field. Okay. And there are further generalizations by Deny, Varu, and, and uh, Bradford, where instead of looking at finite simple groups, you look at um, Chevalet groups over Z mod QZ, where Q is not a prime anymore, and, and then you can prove similar polylog bounds. So in fact, for finite simple groups of Lie type, um, you expect a much better bound to hold. So if, if the rank is fixed, then you expect that in fact it's logarithmic, that D should be 1. Okay. Um, and there is some evidence towards this. It's in joint work with Gambard, where we show that this is indeed the case for PSL2FP, but not, we can't prove it for all primes. We could prove it almost, o only for almost all primes. It's a bit like in Gamble's talk yesterday. So the quantity is independent on J rate. Yeah, that's the point. The what? The, the constant is not independent. That, yeah, so the, C, the constant C depends on the group, but is independent on the generator. Yeah. So yeah, may, maybe the most uh, the, the yeah the, the, the most important case where this conjecture is not solved is for alternating groups. Okay, where yeah, so so you know for a n and then it, it would mean that gamma is like a polynomial in n at most. And so the best bounds today are due to Helfgott and Serish, and it's like this. So it's quite close to polylog. And in fact, as far as I know, there is no counterexample to this conjecture with d bigger than 2. So the, in fact, for a n, you, you, can, you can show that if, like for s n, if you take the one transposition and a long cycle, then the, the, the diameter is like n squared, so it's like log g squared. Mm -hmm. but, can you, can you, yeah, but can you do worse than that? I don't know. In fact, a related question. Uh, which I thought may be the right venue to ask in this uh, today, uh, is, is this. So I wonder, is it true that Babai's conjecture, so it's, it's clearly connected to this Grigorchuk gap conjecture. So is it true that Babai's conjecture implies Grigorchuk's weak gap conjecture for residually finite groups? So Grigorchuk wrote a nice paper a few years ago where he, he, um, he reduced the gap conjecture or the weak gap conjecture uh, two classes of groups, basically if simple groups and residually finite groups. And for residually finite groups, then it's quite clear that there is a connection between this Babai conjecture and the Grigorchuk gap conjecture, because if you have lots of co finite quotients that you can generate quickly, it means that you have at least some large size of the sum ball. Okay. So it's prob prob probable that this can be resolved, actually. Don't know. That a combination of some of us can prove this <laughs> by the end of the talk. Um, so, yeah, so now I, I move on to um, uh, what happens if you have really, so you have finite group, uh, finite Kelly graph, but with a la very large diameter. So the, the analog of polynomial growth in, for infinite groups. Uh, the analog for finite groups is this condition, that the, the, the diameter is bigger than the fixed power of the size of the group. So Benjamini, Finucane, and Tesfra uh, studied scaling limits of Cayley graphs satisfying this property. Uh, so they, in fact, they, it was shortly after uh, we did this work with uh, Green and Tao on approximate groups, they, they used our theorem to show that whenever you have an infinite family of Cayley graphs satisfying this condition. So if you want, you can take this, this find the generating set to be of, uh, of bounded size, and then it just means that gamma is bigger than g to the epsilon, but epsilon is fixed. And suppose you have a, a family, an infinite family of Cayley graphs like that, finite Cayley graphs, and you renormalize 
the metric in, in, in such a way that the, the diameter is one. Okay, so you, we normalize the, the length of each uh, edge in the graph so that the diameter is one. And you, you ask, what are the scaling, what, what are the limits? What are the, in the gormov uh, topology or metric, what, what are the, the limits? And they show that the only scaling limits are actually flat tori uh, with a translation invariant metric. Okay, so, they are, so the metric is not Riemannian, it's some kind of polyhedral norm. So it's a thin slow metric. And so, so this means that your k-graph looks more and more flat. It looks like the, you know, it looks like a torus. Okay, and, and the, the proof of this is based on the, on the structure theorem for approximate groups. And the, the idea is that using this um, structure theorem, you can, you can show that this class of group is, is pre-compact in the gromov hosdorf topology. And you can use Gromov's pre-compactness theorem uh, criterion to get uh, uh, pre-compactness, and then, then you, can, uh, you can show that there is a limit, and you can easily identify the limits because of somehow group invariance. So the limit has to be some homogeneous space because the k graphs are homogeneous. So I'm going to call these groups almost flat, okay? So because they look like tori in some sense. Um, so, in fact, wh when they, 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 they showed this, uh, when I s their paper appeared on archive, they, they somehow they, they had it for S of bounded size. And, and then, um, he, uh, so I realized that if you want to extend it to, to ev even for a when S is bigger, it doesn't have to be of bounded degree, the k graph doesn't have to be of bounded degree, then the result is still continues to hold. But you have to show um, some th something more, which does not follow immediately from um, uh, the BGT theorem. You have to show that um, the following thing. So, uh, so this is true in general. Suppose you have uh, some some set which. So suppose you have a group generating by, by generated by a finite set, and suppose that uh, the at some scale some radius n, s to the n is k doubling. Okay, so s to the 2n is less than k times s to the n. Then, in fact, at every subsequent scale, you will keep, you will stay doubling. Okay, so if you have the doubling condition at some scale in some group, then it's going to continue to be doubling at every other scale, every larger scale. So you need the first scale to be big enough in terms of k, but that's the only thing you need. Okay, so so, yeah, and so that that so the, yeah so yeah so in other words, if if there exists some scale n such that this holds, then for every bigger n you have this condition. Okay. And so it follows from the BGT theorem. So it, of course, the proof uses the BGT theorem because the BGT theorem tells you that if you are doubling at some scale, then the, the, the you know the the ball at that scale looks like or is covered by a few uh, translates of a set of that form, which I call a, which we call with uh, Green and Tau a coset nil progression. Coset nil progression means that there is a finite group H. It's a, it's a group of the f it's a set of the form H times L, where H is a finite group. L is a finite subset which normalizes H, and L mod H is a nil progression. And a nil progression, if I manage to, nil progression is basically the nil progression is is the same thing as an arithmetic progression, but in the context of finite uh, of nilpotent groups. Okay, so you know what's an arithmetic progression uh, for cyclic groups. So for nilpotent groups, it's the same thing, but uh, uh, same same idea. So you say that um, a set is a nil progression if it's a set of all words that you can obtain from some generators. So you pick some generators psi one psi r. Sorry, this should be psi. And you look at all words um, in these letters, and but you assume that there are side lengths that can be quite large numbers, and you assume that every 
uh, so in, in this long word, so every occurrence, so the number of occurrences of, of, the, word, of the letter xi i is at most n i. And you also, you also assume that the group generated by the xi i is, is nilpotent of class s, or at class at most s. So if s is equal to 1, then you see that you recover just the, the notion of multidimensional arithmetic progression. It's just a box. Just a box, right? So it's the xi1 to the, to the n1, xi2 to the n2, and so on. Okay? So these boxes are, have, have bounded doubling. I mean, the doubling depends only on the number of generators in the abelian case, and then in the nilpotent case, they also have dub bounded doubling, and it depends only on the number of generators and the, the nilpotent C class. Okay. And, and so the main lemma to, to get this, uh, this uh, one scale implies all scale uh, doubling property is, is the fact that if you have a nil progression and you look at its <coughs> powers, then they are uniformly doubling. So it's not just that the nil progression is doubling, but the doubling constant does not depend on the power L to the N. So since your ball at, at scale N looks like one of those coset nil progression, the ball at scale at a much larger scale will also look like a power H L to the N. And so it will have bounded doubling. Okay. And so this bounded doubling condition is precisely what you need for the Gromov um, pre-compactness criterion to kick in and to show local, uh, to, to show that there is a limit uh, in this Benjamini, Finucane, and Tesra theorem. Okay, so um, uh, so conversely, so here's the first theorem uh, that uh, we can get using these ideas. That wh whenever you have a finite group which is almost flat in that sense, so the the size of, um, of gamma, the, the, sorry, the, the diameter is, is quite big in that sense, then, um, then the, the only reason this can happen is because G has a large virtually nilpotent quotient. So there is a G mod H, so it's a subgroup H which is, which is tiny, it's contained in a small ball of radius gamma to the delta, such that, such that G mod H has a nilpotent subgroup of bounded index. Okay. Um, and I should say that uh, we cannot really hope to weaken this theorem. So you could th you think maybe you can replace this epsilon by some smaller function of the size of g, which goes to zero. But uh, it's not the case. So you can build counterexamples with diameter bigger than g to the any function going to zero, and still there are no subgroups of bounded index and no nilpotent, no abelian quotients. And so I should say also that the bounds, so there's no effective bound here on, um, um, sorry, on, um, on this constant C epsilon delta on the index, because there is no effective bound on, on the BGT theorem. Okay, so the source of ineffectiveness is kept here. I mean, it comes from this theorem and we cannot get rid of it. And in fact, so the, the, in the constant in the BGT theorem, it's not effective. But you can prove that it's not actually not polynomial. So there is this uh, related conjecture in additive combinatorics called the polynomial feynman rouja conjecture, which sa says that somehow the bounds in this Feynman theorem should be polynomial. But in the non-commutative version, it's not the case. So we have a counterexample with four logs here. <laughs> and it, it comes from this group here, this width product of c men with fp, where you have to tune p and n correctly. And so, yeah, so uh, similar version of this theorem that I just stated is, is that instead of having nilpotent quotient, you can just maybe have a, a, a slightly weaker but um, maybe easier to, to grasp statement which says that in fact whenever you have this then there is a large abelian quotient. Okay. So the only reason why a Cayley graph has large diameter is because there is a, an abelian, a large abelian quotient. Okay. And the normal subgroup here is contained in a small ball, small of radius square root of gamma. <coughs> Another way to, f to, to reformulate this or to phrase it is, is that G has a subgroup of bounded index which maps onto a large cyclic group of roughly the same diameter. 
Okay, so you can think of like this. So if, if, if there is a group with large diameter, then it, in fact it maps basically onto a, a cyclic group up to finite index or to bounded index, it maps onto a cyclic group. And cyclic groups have, of course, very large diameter. Sorry. OK, so here is a consequence of this. Um, so remember Babai's conjecture about finite simple groups, that it was log g to the little o of 1. So an immediate cons consequence of this is that you get Babai's conjecture with a much weaker bound. But which holds for all finite simple groups, okay? So, so if G is not a billion finite simple group, then the diameter is less than G to some little o of one, okay? So, in other words, if you fix epsilon, there are only finitely many finite simple groups with diameter bigger than G to the epsilon. And okay, and but so I should mention that maybe. Previously, all approaches towards Babai's conjecture were based on the classification <coughs> of finite simple groups by studying particular cases. This does not. So this is independent. It does not use the classification, okay? Because it's geometric. So. And the reason, why, why does it follow? Because you have, a, you have a normal subgroup here, okay? So it cannot be simple. Yeah, so um, what about so with the Chigger constant and the spectral gap? So you can, what I talked about the diameter, but it's well known that there is a relation between diameter and spectral gap for uh, Katie graphs. So if, if you take H is the Chigger constant and lambda 1 is the first eigenvalue of the Laplace operator, then it's always the case in H is that H is bigger than 1 over the diameter. If you take a general graph, usually H is bigger than 1 over the size of the graph, but for Vertex transitive graphs, it's one of the diameter. It's, it's much better. And you have this Chigger Buzo inequality here. So, so this means that, in fact, you can replace, in the previous statement, you can replace the assumption that the diameter is uh, bigger than a small power of g by the, f the assumption that the Chigger constant of the lambda 1 is smaller than an inverse power of g. Then you get the same conclusion, then you are almost flat, you have this large abelian quotient, and so on. Here is another consequence of, of this, um, of what I just mentioned. It's related to a theorem of Lacanby. So Lacanby was interested in uh, the, you know, the virtual Betty number conjecture, Thurston's conjecture on three manifolds. And, and in his program to, to, to prove this conjecture, he, uh, he, he used, um, he, his idea was to use property tau, or the failure of property tau, uh, to produce a, a um, you know, a finite index subgroup that maps onto Z, take a, the pi one of a three manifold, and so he he showed that whenever you have a yeah so he showed this that when whenever you have a finite a finitely generated in fact he needed finitely presented group and a sequence of of normal subgroups gamma n. Uh, of finite index <coughs> such that the Chigger constant is quite small. So you know, property, you say that <coughs> gamma has property tau with respect to gamma n if these Chigger constants are bounded away from zero. Okay. So, but Lacanry said, okay, suppose it does not have property tau in a strong way, in the sense that the, the, the Chigger constant is smaller than <coughs> 1 over the square root of the, of the degree of the cover or the index then you can conclude that there is a finite index subgroup that maps onto <coughs> Z. Okay? So we can recover this theorem. It just follows from what I just said. For, for the, you know, it follows from the structure of these almost flat groups. Uh, and we can re replace this one half that can be had by this epsilon. Okay? So if you, if you really don't have property tau in a strong way, it's because you map onto Z, up to finite index. Okay, so this is just basically an observation. We, we don't have a nice program like Lackenby had to use this. But. And here's a question which might interest you. I thought a little bit about it, but I'm not sure. Um, so can we replace the, can, can we get rid of the assumption that gamma n is, is uh, normal here? I don't know. 
So finally, I, I want to talk about um, mixing times for random walks. So when you study a calligraph, you you know you want to study some geometric invariants of it, like the diameter or the lambda one, the Chigu constants. Another interesting invariant is this mixing time of the random walk. So, so the mixing time is this. So you 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 fix p between one and infinity. You look at, at the LP norm, and you look at the first time when the the random walk at time you know at time ends. This is the nth convolution power of the of the simple random walk you know on the on the graph. You look at the first time when it's quite close to the uniform distribution. Mu g is the uniform distribution on g, quite close in LP norm, let's say. Okay. So for Kelly graphs, it's it's quite easy to to prove you know using the Young, Young inequality and Cauchy-Schwarz basically that. Tp and T infinity are comparable if P <coughs> is bigger than 1. But T1, which is uh, sometimes called the total variation mixing time, the L1 norm, uh, it could be much smaller in general. And in general, you always have this, these, these inequalities, so the mixing time is at least the diameter. So of course, you need to visit every site before you become equidistributed. And because of this bound on the lambda one I mentioned before, this lower bound, you get that it's the mixing time is at most gamma square times log g, so it's at most gamma cube. Okay, so it's so it sticks between it's uh, it stays between gamma and gamma cube. <coughs> and for example, if you take the lamplighter group on with cyclic base, so it's a finite group, uh, cyclic base, then you can show that uh, the diameter is roughly n, so and t one is roughly gamma squared. But t infinity is roughly gamma cube. So this, this upper bound is actually attained in, for some groups. Okay. Uh, in the case when g is nilpotent of bounded nilpotency class, the mixing times have, uh, are, are roughly in gamma squared. If you have an expander, then the mixing time is gamma, roughly. But if you have this diffusive behavior like you have it for nilpotent groups, the, 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 the mixing time is gamma squared. So this is, was proved by Diaconis and South Coast in the 90s. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and so in, the, in this paper, uh, so actually Diaconis and South Coast published two papers in the 90s uh, about this, um, these mixing times and uh, quadratic mixing times. And for the, in one of them, they introduced this notion of group of moderate growth. So they say that a, a finite group has moderate growth if um, it satisfies in its, this inequality. So it grows, it grows not, not too slowly. So it's moderate growth. Okay. So um, like this. So actually, Diaconis talked about it in Paris last year, the same, the, the previous version of this conference <laughs> in January. Um, a is a, const a constant. So I'm sorry, it shouldn't be double bars here. Yeah. A is a constant. And they show that if G has moderate growth, then the mixing times uh, in every LP norm are comparable to gamma squared. Okay. If you have moderate growth. And so nilpotent groups have moderate growth. That's what one of the things they show. And what we can prove using this BGT theorem is, is this, uh, the fact that, in fact, moderate growth and almost flatness is, is the same thing. So, in fact, you see, if, you, if I go back, if you look at this and you, put, you, you substitute n equals 1 here, you, you recover the, moderate, the almost flat condition. You recover that gamma is at least a small power of the size of g. So it's clear that moderate growth implies almost flat, but it's not clear that the converse holds, and actually it's true. Okay? So the, the converse holds. So uh, you're, yeah, you have moderate growth if and only if you are most flat. And so in particular, you get that uh, groups with moderate growth are finite by nilpotence, by the theorem 1 that I stated before. And where the finite part has very small diameter. So they are basically, the calligraph is like, you know, they, it's fibered by some small, fi small finite parts and a large nilpotent quotient. 
And therefore, if you apply the diaconis of cost theorem, you get that almost flat groups have mixing time in gamma square. And an uh, interesting question is, what about the converse? Can you characterize k-graphs with qu quadratic mixing time? <coughs> so it's, not, it's a subtle question, because already for the lamplighter group, the uh, t1 is quadratic, but t infinity is <coughs> gamma cube. But suppose that all mixing times are quadratic. Can you say something about the k graph? No. Not sure. So yeah, I'll, I'll finish by one theorem which uh, relates, which is about uh, mixing time again, which is a, another generalization, another extension of this diaconic style of cost theorem, which in which you, you want to show quadratic mixing time but you don't assume these conditions on, on growth. The only thing you assume is some doubling condition. Okay. So I want to say that the only thing I assume on my group it is that it is doubling at some scale. Okay. And we can show that if the scale, if, it, if you are doubling with some, you know, some fixed doubling constant k, so if the size of the ball of radius 2n is less than k times the size of the ball of radius n, for some n, where if this n is less than this, the diameter to the two-third, uh, then we, it's enough to get quadratic doubling. And this two-third is sharp. And so the reason is because of this Lamplighter example where you, you, you can have <coughs> a gamma cube as a, as a mixing time. And so you can, you can play with products and, and show that you, know, you, can, uh, you can still be doubling at size bigger than gamma to the two, two, two third and uh, have much larger uh, mixing time. Okay, but um, so the point is that, you know, in this diaconic self cost theorem, if you uh, assume moderate growth or, or almost flatness, then you get doubling at some very small scale. Okay, so you get doubling at scale gamma to the delta, gamma to the O of one. So that's, a, so that's an extension of that. Okay, so it's enough to assume doubling at some small scale, and you get quadratic. So the point is, yeah, the point is that you, you again, you apply BGT, and you, you have this finite group and this nilpotent part, and the finite group is small enough that uh, the, the random walk will equidistribute quickly there, and so then you get quadratic mixing time in the nilpotent quotient. Okay, uh, and I'll finish by this question. Um, so... In fact, this BGT theorem, it, so it, it, it works when the, when the doubling condition occurs at some scale, not, not too large, not too small. But if it's too large in the sense that the, the doubling happens really close to the diameter, then it, it does not tell you much. Uh, because the, 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 you need to take this, this finite subgroup is contained in a small power of, in a small product of uh, your general, so it's, small power like a union a inverse to the power eight so you you it could be that this is the entire group and so if the doubling happens like in this range then it's not clear what to say and it probably still you have this quadratic behavior and this kind of bgt theorem that the group is close to finite by nilpotent but it, 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 it's n we, we don't know how to handle it so i'll finish it thanks Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Uh, I think Misha shot first. Uh, yes, what, uh, what point are the vacuums and the vacuums and the vacuums? So it's, it's a bit similar as in your theorem, so it's ineffective because we, <coughs> we, we I mean, we, we take uh, a huge limits and uh, by we take ultra an ultra filter and ultra product and we, we construct this limit. So we take a sequence of counterexamples and we build the limit and we. We don't it's not yeah. combinatorial because it's, yeah. Yeah, it's combinatorial. Yeah, it's not combinatorial. The proof is not combinatorial. I mean, the proof goes by constructing a limit and doing analysis on this limit, li in limit the space. Limit, what do you use in the limit? What do you what? In the limit, what kind of uh, result do you use? Uh, so we, we, we use, of course, again, it's, it's similar to your proof. So it's, we, we use uh, the Hilbert's fifth theorem, yes. and, but we have to go inside the proof of this Gleason lemmas okay. to, to, okay. to, to and yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I think 
if I understood you correctly, it follows from what you said that, for example, if you have finite, if you have a finite group with bounded exponent, um, then it will have a small diameter because you don't have this big cyclic uh, section. Yeah. Uh, this is also a bit surprising. I mean, mm -hmm. um, is there a direct argument for this? And more ambitiously, maybe one can use it to reprove the restricted bound side problem. <laughs> Yeah, so I thought about this. In fact, it's a very interesting question to maybe effectivize the restricted bound side problem. You know, if you uh, instead of assuming that you have bounded bounded exponent, you assume that every element in a very large ball has fixed exponents. It should be enough to conclude. But yeah, actually, it's, it's related to probabilistic idea. Okay. Okay. More questions. Okay, so we thank you.